What's up, Cap Kick Sports listeners? Tim Wheaton here. I see you. We are 28 to 34 years old, 100% male listeners. So you guys like uh, Halo? You guys like Call of Duty? Yeah. Used to play video games, but now you don't have time? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Used to talk video games, and now I talk sports, and here we are. So this weekend we have TJ Dillashaw versus Corey Sanhagen, and I want to do a breakdown for this fight because it's just such an interesting fight. You got two fighters who are always doing different kinds of shifting and switching types of entries, and it's an especially tough fight to pick because we don't know what kind of shape TJ will be in. He's had two years away, and that's a long time. Has the game simply passed him by, or is he still in his prime? Will TJ Dillashaw's return look more like Cain Velasquez, or will it look more like Dominic Cruz. When we break down this fight, we can only really judge this fight based on what we know. So I'm going to be looking at a prime TJ Dillashaw and comparing him to today's Corey Sanhagen because I can't just say, I can't confidently say that TJ Dillashaw is going to have a bunch of ring rust and therefore blah blah blah. I really don't know that and neither does anybody else until Saturday. I wrote earlier this year that bantamweight might be the best division in the UFC, and I know lightweight is pretty awesome, but I think bantamweight might be the most competitive. It's nothing but former champions and knockout artists. Sandhagen vs. Dillashaw represents a number two ranked versus unranked, and still in this weight class you guys have like Sterling, Yan, Rob Fond, Garbrandt, Marias, Jose Aldo, Edgar, Munoz, Dominic Cruz, Cheeto Vera, and much, much more. So it's a fascinating weight class. I wrote a bunch of words on it earlier this year about how excited I was, and then due to injuries, nothing has actually happened in this weight class. Nothing's really changed since earlier this year, so it's become one of the most interesting weight classes where nothing is actually happening. As for this Saturday's fight, we have Sanhagen, who's won seven out of his eight UFC fights. His only loss was a really fast submission to the champion, Aljamain Sterling. His last fight was a quick knockout of former champion Frankie Edgar, and before that, he had a spinning wheel kick knockout against Marlon Marias. TJ Dillashaw probably doesn't need any introduction. Former champion making his comeback after his two-year performance-enhancing drug suspension. Last fight was a loss to Henry Cejudo in early 2019. He's won 12 out of 16 UFC fights. When he came onto the scene, he battered reigning champion Henan Barrao after Barrao was undefeated in 33 fights. Uh, he lost to Cruz and retook his title from Cody Garbrandt. The matchup this weekend of Sanhagen vs. Dillashaw is a great matchup for a lot of reasons. Two fighters, like I said, who frequently switch stances use a lot of different shifts and to very different effects. Really what I want to talk about more than anything is TJ Dillashaw's striking system. And I call it a striking system with confidence and we're going to be breaking it down of where it really works, where it succeeds, and where it begins to fall apart. TJ Dillashaw consistently uses a shifting entry, meaning that he brings his rear position to his front position. He also pivots frequently on entry. This makes it particularly challenging because a fighter often won't know what direction TJ will be going when he enters to strike. TJ can also use this feint entry into a takedown, and once you get the fear of the takedown, he'll begin to fake the duck low for a takedown, and then he'll return with an uppercut or a head kick. So what is the TJ Dillashaw striking system? Well, how it looks with this feinting entry, imagine a clock, and the fighter is dead center on the clock. TJ is standing at 9 o'clock. He shifts and pivots. TJ is now standing at 12 o'clock, while the fighter is still looking at 9 o'clock. That's what the cutting an angle means. TJ can also fade entries, so you don't know what position he's trying to go in. Sometimes that shifting entry will mean that he's standing at 6 o'clock while you're looking at 9 o'clock, or he shifts in and faints, goes a fake direction, and then he'll go in and duck for a takedown. It's an absolutely brilliant system when it succeeds and when it works well. A fighter like Hennon Burrell was tailor-made to be caught in this system. His idea of cage control was to control the center, which is very conventional, and he's not wrong. So often TJ's entries against Burrell uh, Burrell would stand completely still and try to counter from that standing position, which means that TJ was just able to pivot all around him, rotate on him whenever he want, cut angles whenever he want, and in this fight, TJ was able to land 140 significant strikes using this technique. So now on the system, we're going to talk about layers, and quite often in striking, we do talk about striking layers. Layer one in this case is the entry. That's the shift and the pivot and the strike. So that's the entry there. Layer two is anything that happens after the entry, and this is where the system begins to become a little bit more frayed. We saw in the Dominic Cruz fight, he was able to shut the TJ system down simply by taking a step back 
after the entry had began. So lots of forward pressure to force the exchanges from Cruz, and then Cruz would step back when TJ began the exchange. That way, if TJ were to throw strikes, he couldn't pivot and he couldn't rotate. Instead, TJ had to chase on a straight line against Cruz. Another person who was really effective at this was Leota Machida. He would take a step back so that you couldn't pivot or rotate on your entry. Instead, you had to move on straight lines. And this is what Cruz did against TJ. Dominic Cruz would choose the exchanges uh, of where to engage, and he would control the angle at which the exchange would happen, and because of this, TJ would often chase after Dominic Cruz, and Cruz was able to land a lot of counter punches throughout the exchanges and win the fight. Cody Garbrandt used a different technique to success. He would allow TJ to enter using whatever entry TJ wanted, and then he would counter him as TJ was throwing, because TJ always enters, and then he does combination punching once he's chosen the angle. And what Garbrandt would do was allow that to happen, and then interrupt the combination just by throwing counter punches. In their first fight, three times TJ used a shift entry into a 1-2 hook, and this is from the orthodox position. Cody would thread the counter as the two was coming and before the hook was thrown. It happened three times. So you can beat TJ in the exchange itself, or you can step back to change where the exchange is taking place. Those are the keys to victory for beating TJ Dillashaw. Well, let's talk about some of the habits of Corey Sandhagen. He does lots of stance switching, he does lots of shifting entries, and lots of movements. He mainly looks to use his jab and low kicks because he's a long boy. He, he's going to have a significant height advantage in this fight, and he's had a significant height advantage in most of his fight at bantamweight. He also mixes his strikes of high and low very well. He often jabs to draw a response and then counters, and we saw this against Marias and Lineker where he'll jab and then take a step back and his opponent will be now entering on a straight line and Sanhagen can land counters from there. Also lots of front kicks to really emphasize that height advantage. Uh, he uses a jab to set everything up and I love to see that. Please use your jab as much as possible. Uh, he does a jab to low kick, jab to spinning back kick and that was against Marlon Marias. So he fights long extremely well. Some issues that are kind of consistent in his fights is that he has a very low takedown defense percentage. Um, I'm fairly suspicious of his counter wrestling as well. Both Aljamain Sterling and Frankie Edgar were able to get Sanhagen against the back of the cage and then start putting some work into him. Uh, Frankie Edgar was able to throw combinations and Sanhagen was forced to turtle and rotate out, whereas Aljamain Sterling continued, he kind of went for a takedown and then got a submission from there and it worked very successfully. So I think the keys to beating Sanhagen are pressure him against the cage so that he can't move out and also mix in lots of takedowns. TJ Dillashaw is a D1 wrestler coming into this fight, so previous to him using the shifting entry TJ Dillashaw systems, he was much more focused on uh, getting takedowns and landing ground and pound, and we might see that TJ Dillashaw in this fight. We should see exchanges on the feet with TJ mixing in takedowns. If TJ gets the takedown successfully, he should win this fight. However, if Sanhagen can control the range, choose his engagement, Sanhagen should win this fight. Now it's a fun matchup for a lot of different reasons that we've talked about of just how these people match up and one X factor is also the Apex Arena where it's actually much smaller so a long boy like Sanhagen has fewer advantages. If you are a fighter who backs yourself up against the cage that will not bode well in the smaller cage at the UFC Apex Arena. But we will see on Saturday night. Now, the winner of this matchup is likely to get a title shot next after Petr Jan and Aljamain Sterling kind of figure out what they're doing with neck injuries and whatever. Realistically, while this fight is five rounds, it should actually be for an interim title match. I mean, one guy's out, the champion's out due to injury. I, I don't know what else you would need to make the case that this needs to be an interim title, whereas in heavyweight, we had a defense just three months ago, and now we're slapping an interim title on that division. But it, you know, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say the Dana Whiteism. It is what it is. With Calf Kick Sports, earlier this week we had an interview with Dre Miley, the One-Eyed Dragon. Make sure to check that out. I also wrote a big feature about the changing dynamics of sumo wrestling over the past 20 years. It's a really interesting piece. Make sure to check that out as well. Calf Kick Sports will be back with more interviews next week as well. Just wanted to do a really quick one this week because of how much I do like this fight and how interesting this fight is. So I'm not going to be breaking down the rest of the card, but we will be back next week. So make sure to check out all of our interviews and other radio shows that we'll have going on. My name is Tim Wheaton with Calf Kick Sports, and thanks so much for your time. Thanks for listening.